We're in a series called Follow. We want to follow Jesus' teaching. We want to follow his example. And a disciple is a follower. And we've said, if you're not following, you're not a follower of Jesus. And there are things that happen when you follow, things that mark that. So we want to lean into that today. Long before LBJ was a loop around Dallas, he was a president of the United States. Now, if any of you historians out there are aware of that. Lyndon Baines Johnson, president of the United States from 1963 to 1968. Now, he was a Texan, very much a Texan. Some of you have toured the LBJ Ranch and down in central Texas. And on the wall of President Johnson's White House office hung a framed letter. And what made it so special is it was signed by Sam Houston. Uh, General, Senator Sam Houston. And uh, it was a letter from Houston to Johnson's great-grandfather. And Johnson's great-grandfather, the Reverend George Washington Baines. He would go on to be the third president, Baylor. He was a pastor. At the same time, he was president at Baylor. And Here's, here's the uniqueness of it. Baines had led General Sam Houston to faith in Christ. And for those who knew him, the hard life he lived, the difficulties, uh, he was a difficult person in so many ways, kind of a dark person in many ways, but he became a changed man when Jesus came into his life. The day came for Houston to be baptized, and it was, a, it was an event that the news, newspapers Around Texas, uh, they showed up for the baptism. It's big news when General Sam Houston's going to be baptized. And by then, Houston's wife and mother in law, they were members of the Independence Baptist Church. And the pastor at Independence Baptist Church was Rufus Burleson, who would also become a president at Baylor. And I think every pastor in Central Texas was a president of Baylor back in those days. And Houston was baptized by Burleson. I appreciated this part. On November the 19th, uh, 1854, November. Now, we're baptizing outside today. Uh, it's warmer weather than it would be in Texas in uh, November. He was baptized in Little Rocky Creek, so outdoor baptism for sure. One of, there are a couple of stories that come out of it. Houston... After he was baptized, he came up out of the water and he said, Dr. Burleson, you baptized my pocketbook. He forgot to empty his pockets. He still had his wallet, his money in his pockets when he was baptized. Dr. Burleson, being a good Baptist preacher, said, Thank God. I wish the pocketbook of every Baptist had been baptized. Uh, one of the news accounts announcing General Houston's baptism by immersion in that Baptist church. Uh, it said people were excited, surprised, because so many, this is the quote, saw him past praying for. And yet, through the saving power of Jesus Christ, he comes to the Lord. And one person, this is in the news account, one person said, General, I hear your sins were washed away. And Houston's response was, Lord, help the fish down below. <laughs> We're talking about baptism today, and following the Lord in baptism. Symbols are always an important part of life. You think about this. The American flag is a symbol, a symbol of our union as states. It represents the freedoms and the ideals that we hold dear. It represents the price paid for all that we enjoy in this nation. I have a college diploma on my wall. It represents more than a graduation day. It represents four very long years. Some of you would say, well, my diploma represents a lot more than that. It represents 10 years, 15 years. Uh, it represents a, a lot of tests, a lot of exams, a lot of study, a lot of effort. My wedding ring's a symbol. It's a symbol of almost 32 years of marriage to my wife, Rhonda. And it represents a lot of commitments that we've made since the day we made that commitment to one another uh, on our wedding day. Today I'm talking about baptism. And some people, this is the phrasing that sometimes gets attached to baptism. 
don't put too much on it. It's a mere symbol. I've heard that said. And a lot of, I've seen it, read it in books. It's a mere symbol. It's a whole lot more than a mere symbol. The flag, the diploma, my ring, they're a lot more than a symbol. And the same is true for baptism. It's a whole lot more than that. Now, some of you have questions about baptism. And if not, you know someone who has questions about baptism. What does it mean? What's it about? Why do we do it? And there are two there are two. Two big problems when it comes to discussing baptism. Here's the first one. The first one is we make too much of it. We assign too much uh, importance to it. And the other is we minimize it. We make it something purely elective. Like it's no big deal. You can do it. You cannot do it. It doesn't make any difference. God doesn't care one way or the other. And, and we're going to find some ground in the middle of that that is, I think is much more biblical. We're going to try to answer some good biblical questions about baptism so here we go this is from Matthew chapter 3 beginning in verse 13 the baptism of Jesus then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him John would have prevented him saying I need to be baptized by you and you come to me But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. All right baptism we're going to run through the whole thing here you have lots of room to write i hope you'll make notes because this is something comes up regularly in conversations with folks you need to be able to answer these questions and maybe answer these questions for your own heart today first what is the meaning of baptism and here's what it means it illustrates the death the burial and the resurrection of christ paul wrote to the church at corinth and this is what he said christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture he was buried he was raised on the third day and he wanted to write to the Colossians, talking about, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him, you were raised to a new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. So baptism is intended to be a small sermon. When I talk about baptism, before every time when I'm baptizing, before we baptize, we're going to have this discussion. I'm going to say baptism is a picture. You're acting out the central story in the Bible, the gospel story. Jesus died on the cross. He was buried. He was raised from the dead. Baptism is an important declaration, and it's a powerful sermon. Second thing, baptism illustrates my spiritual cleansing from sin. Bible says, Titus 3, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. The picture in baptism is that just as, just as water would wash dirt off the outside of us if we'd been rolling in a pig pen all day, what Jesus has done for us in the cross washes away the sin on the inside the same way. Third thing baptism says, it illustrates a new life in Christ. And this is a beautiful part of the baptism uh, declaration. Therefore, Paul says to the second, in 2 Corinthians, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. To the Romans, with that newness illustration, he says, in time to baptism, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You bury an old life and you leave it behind. And you say in baptism, I have a whole new life because of Jesus in me. Baptism is a symbol of new life in relationship to Christ. Now baptism, here's the thing. Baptism doesn't make you a believer. Baptism is a declaration, a public commitment before others that you are a believer, that you already believe. Now, throughout Christian history, there have been people who assigned an inflated meaning to baptism. They made it a bigger deal and a different deal than the Bible makes baptism. So there have been those who said a person must be baptized in order to have a relationship to God. You can't go to heaven unless you've been baptized. 
And they point to a couple of verses in the New Testament as their, as their source material for that. And I want you to remember, the, in interpreting the Bible, you interpret the Bible in light of the whole Scripture, not an isolated verse here or there. You can make the Bible say just about anything you want if you, you cherry-pick verses. So you look at the whole doctrine of salvation, you see that is an impossibility. Max Licato, he comes from a Church of Christ background. Max Licato talks about baptism this way, and this is what he said. With the exception of the thief on the cross, there's no example of an unbaptized believer. The thief on the cross, however, is a crucial exception. It's not an accident that the first one to accept the invitation of the crucified Christ has no creed, confirmation, christening, or catechism. Here's a man who never went to church, never gave an offering, never was baptized, and said only one prayer. But that prayer was enough. The thief reminds us that though our dogma may be airtight, our doctrine dead center, in the end, it's only Jesus that saves. Baptism doesn't save. You, you, your faith in Christ does that. Baptism is like a wedding ring. This ring, there's nothing in Texas law that says I have to have a, wear this ring to be married. I wear this ring to declare I'm married, to let people know I'm married, to remind myself I am married. It's an outward symbol of a commitment I have made in my heart. Think, think about it this way. I've talked to folks about this before. It's, there are plenty of, plenty of groups that say you've got to be baptized to be saved. If that is true, who controls baptism? The church controls. You have to take this to its logical conclusion. Who controls baptism? Church controls baptism. So church controls who gets saved and who doesn't get saved, if that's the case. Is that biblical? No. And so, there's only one way to be saved. It's through Jesus Christ. And if the church controls baptism, they control who becomes a Christian and who doesn't. And that doesn't make sense because forgiveness of sin, relationship to God, and eternity in heaven are going to be based on what Jesus did. Not based on what we do. Here's the way Paul said, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of your own doing, which if you say, I'm saved by grace through faith, oh, and what I did. No, you can't combine with what you do. Oh, and I'm a good person, and I'm baptized, and I did this, and I did this. It's not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. Okay. So, does all of that mean baptism is not important? Does that mean that baptism is significant? That it can be easily discarded if you don't want to do it? And I'm going to come down with a real hard no. Uh, it's important. It's a big deal. We are baptized to follow Jesus' example of public commitment to our Father in heaven. We are baptized in following Jesus' command to public, publicly identify ourselves as I belong to Jesus. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I will follow him. And people, it's okay for people to know that. The Bible calls baptism a pledge of clear conscience toward God in 1 Peter. A pledge of clear conscience toward God. And that promise, that pledge is, is vital. This is one of the things that we've identified. Baptism is a is a real marker because it separates the tire kickers from the car buyers. Does that make sense? It separates those who are just, oh, I'm interested in religious stuff, I'm interested in spiritual things, from those who say, I'm all in. This, this, isn't, a, this isn't just a religious exercise for me. I, I, I have made a commitment of my life. I'm serious. Would you feel comfortable marrying someone who said, I love you with all my heart. I want us to spend the rest of our lives together. The only, the only complication in that is, I really would like to keep it secret. So we're going to have to fly under the radar and not let people know that we're married. Uh, but I really love you and I'm so committed to you. It's just I don't want anybody, including my family and friends, to know that we're married well, you probably wouldn't be real excited about that commitment. And God's not excited about that kind of commitment either. It's one thing to say in the privacy of your own heart that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. 
It's another thing to walk out of the shadows and to stand before your family and your friends and a church family and declare your commitment to Christ before others. And it's an important step. It moves a lot of things. It, it, it gets you unstuck from some things. It raises the bar. Jesus commanded his disciples, if you belong to me, if you're following me, do this publicly to declare it, to show it, to illustrate it, make it publicly through baptism. One of the things that we have found in baptism is baptism strengthens resolve. It strengthens commitment. There's something that shifts in a heart when someone is baptized that, okay, this is more than this is more than casual. This is more than, yeah, sure, I got nothing else to do today but than to give my life to Jesus. It, it, it just it strengthens a commitment. It creates an accountability. It gives you the opportunity for prayer and support and encouragement from other believers in your newfound faith. And it says, I have a new life in Jesus Christ. Okay, why be baptized? Next big, big category here. Why be baptized by immersion? And that's how we baptize here. That means you go into the water. You come back up. First thing is because Jesus was baptized that way. After his baptism, as Jesus came, Jesus came up out of the water. We read that just a moment ago. Whatever Jesus did, I want to follow his example. I want to be like him. Experience what he experienced. And again, if you say, I follow Jesus, there are things that you do. And there are things you don't do. Every baptism in the Bible was by immersion. And that's an important point to make. Uh, just an example, Philip and the eunuch. They both went down into the water, and Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And then they came up out of the water. One of the keys to this is the word baptize. And the word baptize is a transliterated word, not a translated word in our Bible. It, it means uh, they take a... They take the Greek word and they put an English letter with the Greek letter. So baptizo being a Greek word, and you find it in other places, other contexts, it means immerse, dunk, go into the water. It's applied to a spiritual context as baptism, a spiritual commitment to God. So baptize means dip, go under the water. You can say, well, I've been baptized. Well, biblically, if you've been immersed. Otherwise, No. Uh, something meaningful maybe, we'll talk about that in a moment, but not baptism. Why do they baptize by immersion in the New Testament? Why do they find baptism this way, by this mode in the Bible? And that's an easy question to answer, because baptism pictures what? A death, a burial, and a resurrection. Any other form of baptism, you lose the core meaning of what baptism is supposed to declare and represent. And that's why it's important it, how you're baptized. Uh, founders of other de denominations agree with this, though their denominations may have uh, swayed from it. Martin Luther said, I would have those who are to be baptized to be entirely immersed as the work imports and the mystery signifies. And that's what the symbol is, says Martin Luther. John Calvin, the word baptize signifies immerse. Back to the Greek word. It's certain that immersion was the practice of the ancient church. John Wesley said, buried with him alludes to baptizing by immersion according to the custom of the first church. All right, so who should be baptized? And the answer is every person who has believed in Christ. Every person who has believed in Christ. Uh, three verses here, all out of Acts. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Uh, Acts chapter 8, Simon himself believed and was baptized. The verse just before it, but they, when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Who should be baptized? Every person who's believed in Christ, but then... I want to focus on this. The Bible teaches only believers' baptism. See, it's not just the mode. It's not just how you're baptized, the by immersion stuff. It's also, it's, it's also believers' baptism. At 
Our church, we wait until children are old enough to believe and understand the true meaning of baptism before we baptize them. The true meaning of what does it mean to have a relationship to God? What does it mean to surrender your life to Him? What is sin? Till all those things are clarified and they can understand it, they can verbalize it, we wait until then to baptize. Now some churches practice a baptism of confirmation. Some of you are familiar with this. Some of you have experienced this. Baptism of confirmation is a ceremony. It's a covenant between parents and God where parents say, I want to raise my child to know and love God. I want them to grow up in, in the church. And I'm going to dedicate myself as a parent to, to raise them to know and love God, know and love their church. And this baptism of confirmation came around a few hundred years after the Bible was completed. But I'll tell you this. It's a special thing. Uh, it's a lot like our parent-child dedications that we do here at our church. It's a way for a parent to say, I- I'm, I'm going to lean into this. The spiritual development, spiritual life, relationship to God with, with my child is a big deal to me. And I'm going to dedicate myself to this task. And... I mean, I pray every parent makes that commitment. Every parent leans into that. And if, if that's how you grew up, if that was a part of that uh, baptism as a child, as an infant, baptism of confirmation, well, thank the Lord that God, God allowed you to have parents who cared enough about you to raise you up to know and love the Lord and love the church, set you apart for God. And maybe it's because of their commitment that one of these days you're going to have the opportunity. Now maybe you have the opportunity to complete what they desired for you back then by making your own personal commitment to Christ. Because as much as I wanted it for both of my kids when they were young, I can't save my kids. I, I, I can't make them be saved. They had to come to that commitment themselves. We all come to our own commitment to Christ is the only way you're saved. For your parents, it may be an opportunity for you to fulfill the prayer they prayed for you all those years ago by making your own commitment to Christ and submitting to baptism as a teenager, maybe as an adult. And just it's not a sign of disrespect to your parents, and I certainly wouldn't want to say it that way. It's, it's actually a fulfillment of what they prayed for you, what they wanted for you when you make your own commitment to Christ. Now, this is special, but it's different than the baptism in the Bible, again. And that was only for those who are old enough to believe. The, the, the big issue biblically is baptism is for believers. That's why I use that phrase, believer's baptism. That's what makes it a big deal. It's not the commitment your parents made. It's your personal commitment to Christ. See, everybody we find being baptized in the Bible, they were old enough to recognize their sin, mature enough to understand the significance of the death of Christ, and independent enough to make a personal commitment of their lives to him. The purpose of baptism is to publicly confess your personal commitment to Christ. At at our church, we talk about this in the first steps class, our membership class. Baptism is a membership requirement that you have made your personal commitment to Christ and you participated in believer's baptism after making that personal commitment to Christ. So every member would be baptized by immersion and already be believers, even though many uh, of our members were confirmed as children. Now, when should I be baptized? This is a big question, and we won't try to answer this today as clearly as we can. When should you be baptized? As soon as you have believed. And again, baptism is for believers. It's the first act of obedience to the Lord. The first thing you ought to try to lean into, you ought to do to get ready uh, to follow Jesus with all your heart is to do what he said to do first. And again, it helps to nail down. It helps to clarify the commitment to Christ. And if you're considering that commitment, don't, don't wait another day. I mean, give your life to Jesus Christ. Surrender your life to him. Put all your faith in him as your one and only Savior. And then be baptized. The Bible says those who accepted his message were baptized that day. Here's what I want to tell you. Some of you have, you've been holding on to this for a long time, and you haven't moved on it. And as a result, for a lot of people, it just has you stuck. 
You haven't taken steps forward. And baptism just releases you in that. So we have people who are going to be baptized today. Uh, but we have changes of clothes for you to go be baptized today. And that's my challenge to you today. If you want to be baptized today, we are set up and ready to meet you right out here in just a moment. And we'll talk about relationship to Christ and we'll talk about baptism and then we'll baptize. And I want you to lean into this and to pray about it. Now I'm going to let you chew on that for a while while I finish up. There is no reason to delay. As soon as you've decided to, to give your life to Jesus Christ, you ought to be baptized. And you can't wait until you're perfect. You can wait a long time. Oh, the timing's not right yet. I, I'm, there, you're never going to... You wait a long time. When, one of the illustrations, my favorite illustration is when bride and groom. Do a bride and groom know all the implications of those vows that they make on their wedding day? Oh, goodness, no. Do they know every challenge, every threat they're going to face? No, but they know they love one another. and They know they want to spend the rest of their lives together. And that's when they make their commitment publicly as husband and wife. When a willing believer enters the water of baptism. Do you know all the implications of that vow? Well, no. Do you understand every temptation or challenge you're going to face as a follower of Christ? But you know this. You know the love of God. You know that Jesus came, went to the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. And you committed your life to him. And baptism says, I want the world to know about this. Because there's nothing more exciting to me than Jesus. And, and, and I'm not going to hold back. In Matthew 3, 13 through 17, we find the account of Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And we see the, in this act the, the heart of a servant is Jesus models just a whole lot of stuff by being baptized. Now, you, were, you noticed John argued with Jesus about it. And Jesus says, I need to, you know, John says, you're coming to have me baptize you. I need to be baptized by you. I mean, you're Jesus. I, why are you asking me to do this? So here's Jesus. He's a sinless son of God. You might think he'd say, well, you're, you know, I really don't need to be baptized. It is just a symbol, and I'm the Messiah. I'm, I'm in charge here. But in baptism, Jesus models several things that, that are important for us as followers of Christ. Baptism is in front of other believers and people who aren't believers yet. And it's a statement of commitment that is public, and it says... In modeling servanthood and obedience, uh, I'm not ashamed of my relationship to Jesus Christ, and I'm not ashamed to declare it in a special way. A person too proud to be baptized may be too proud to be saved. Baptism says, I will do what Jesus said to do and what Jesus modeled for me to do. Baptism demonstrates the, the submissive aspect of, of a servant. And here's the thing. Somebody else baptizes you. You put yourself in their hands. You place yourself, yourself in their control. And you're saying, in my relationship to Christ, I, I'm not in control. I'm not in charge. I'm renouncing control of my life to my Lord, Jesus Christ. He is Lord, and I am the servant. We baptize, we baptize going back in the water. And uh, that's a symbol of trust. Now, first of all, you're going to trust that I'm going to get you back out of the water. And just for the record, everybody's come back out so far. So, you know, it's, you, you can trust me. But you trust me to get you out of the water again. And that symbolic action, you're saying, I'm trusting God for my whole life. I'm trusting for my salvation. I'm trusting for my eternity. I'm trusting him for today. I'm trusting him for everything. And it's a part of the baptism Act. Baptism is identification with the people of God. You're saying there, there's the me and God and there's the we and God. And there's a we and God aspect to, to baptism that says, I'm, I'm a part of something greater than myself. I'm a part of the people of God, the kingdom of God, the, the work of God in the world alongside these servants of God. And it says, I need to be in the company of other believers if I'm going to grow, if I'm going to mature and you declare in baptism, I'm a part of God's people. In baptism, you remind... This is the great part about baptism for me. I was baptized a long time ago in Victoria, Texas. And 
Every time I'm part of a baptism, though, it takes me back to Victoria, Texas, where we were without a pastor at the little church we were members of in Victoria. We didn't have a pastor for uh, about a year and a half, and there were a whole set of people who waiting to be baptized. We didn't have anybody to baptize anybody. And uh, when we were baptized, they just lined us up. And uh, I was one of the youngest ones in the group at nine years old. A lot of teenagers had committed their lives to Christ that year. And I was uh, toward the end of that long line. And I still remember it so vividly that night so well at uh, that little church. And when I'm a part of baptism here, when I see a baptism, it takes me back. And it reminds me of what Christ has already done in my life and what he did this morning and what I'm looking forward to him doing tomorrow. And there are a lot of spiritual markers tied to what baptism takes me to when I see a baptism. Baptism is a powerful testimony of God working in the lives of his people. And it begins the servant of the Lord on the right path to following God with a sense of submission and a sense of obedience and baptism says, we sang this earlier, because Jesus in my life, I will never be the same again.